Hello and welcome to the Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. My guest today is Sir Terry Leahy, the man who turned Tesco into the UK's biggest retailer and changed the way we shop forever. Once named the most influential non-elected person in Britain, he's now an investor, advisor and author. Sir Terry, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. You changed the world of Brit British retailing through Tesco. How did, how did Tesco change you? Uh, well, I grew up in Tesco. I mean, I, I joined straight from university. Uh, and uh, I wasn't even sure that, you know, business was for me. But um, so really, you had second. What, what were you going to do? What was the what were the other career options? Well, I considered being an architect, but then my degree was management science, so that pushed me in that direction. But I got into retailing purely by accident. But once I was there, I found that I really was fascinated by people, their lives, what changes, and uh, what you might do about mm. it. I mean, and you took that business right to the top. If you were to look at factors that that get you there and keep you there. What are the what are the lessons you learned? I think the one thing is is focus on your customers. Try to get as close as you possibly can to them. Learn as much about their lives, their interests, their needs, uh, and work out what you can do about it. How can you help in some small way? And you've always got a business because people's needs are always developing. They're always changing, whether it's in the digital economy or the traditional economy. Uh, and if you can position yourself in front of a customer as being useful to them, you've got a business. And you, and you started off in the marketing side. I mean, is, is every little help? Is that, is, that, is that one of your uh, creations? Is that uh, in terms of actually the sort of the the supermarket sort of uh, motto. Where, yeah, where it came at that from? time. So it wasn't my creation. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, from our advertising agency, um, uh, Frank Lowe. Uh, but, it, but it applied beautifully to what we were trying to do, which was to say, look, you, you've, you've got busy lives as customers. Uh, we're not the whole part of it. We're one small part of it. But if we can help you in some small way, every little helps. Right. I mean, and you, under your tenure, you turned it into a proper premiership outfit. When you look at it today, how good is that business in terms of the one you left behind? Well, it's, it's a very strong business. I mean, there's 40 plus billions of turnover in the UK alone. Uh, it's a big business uh, and, and a clear leader in the UK. Now, it's had some difficult times, but it's been a very challenging environment as well. You know, the, re the Great Recession was five years long. Uh, and and the, Tesco wasn't alone in the supermarket industry in perhaps not responding quickly enough to the pressures consumers were under in that recession. But I believe they're getting it right now and you're beginning to see quite a sustained recovery. So I always think about you as one of a set of sort of supermarket chiefs that were really in the business of going for growth. When you look at leaders of British retail today, do you still see that same style, that same ambition that maybe the Hughes, the Justin Kings, the Stuart Roses, the others were well known for in their time in terms of their management style and the things they were trying to achieve? Well, they've got different challenges. Um, for, you know, they, they, they are trying to guide the industry out of a long recession. Uh, and they have new competition. Uh, Aldi and Little have always been around, but the larger now, the, the, the discounters, there's more online competition. So they're, so they're navigating a different path. Mm. Um, but, but do they I'm have the flair? Do they have the, the same? I mean, there's a, there's a real sense that you and, and leaders like you sort of set the stall out for Britain on a global stage that we were there to be taken seriously. Do you get the sense that actually the new sort of set that have sort of come in behind you have got that same sense of ambition? Well, it's a little early to judge them. The, um, David Potts, who I worked with for many years, is doing a, a good job at uh, Morrison's. Um, and I believe Dave Lewis is uh, guiding Tesco well. It's a little early in the uh, you know, period of office to judge. Um, but certainly they'll have to innovate. You can't just stay the same. Uh, and if they do innovate in a contemporary way, uh, if they do make themselves more relevant to customers, then they'll get rewarded for it. So one of your big innovations, the thing that you really focused on was data, the Tesco club car. But when you look at that today in terms of how that drives 
the online shopping experience. Were you aware in your time at Tesco, did you get a sense that actually online was coming in as big a way as it's ultimately turned out to be? No, I, I, I don't think anybody really could appreciate the, 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 the scale that it would, uh, it would, it would achieve. Um, going back to Club Card, uh, that really transformed Tesco. Uh, and, and my career mm. um, and uh, that was way back in 1995 and uh, in a way it was the birth of big data and uh, it allowed us to really for the first time know who our customers are and we actually did it originally just to say thank you to them because people would come in week after week they might spend in the year two three thousand pounds mm. and we couldn't even say thank you to them. And, but a lot of people get worried about the amount of data that businesses like the supermarkets keep on them. I mean, that kind of privacy issue, did that ever worry you that actually there was a, a trade-off between we know our customers better but maybe we know a bit too much about them? It did worry us. Uh, it, was a, it was an innocent time and people didn't talk much about it then. But I think, in a way, Tesco was ahead of its time because we did worry about it and we had very clear rules. First of all, we asked people um, uh, uh, you know, could we use data? We always made it anonymous. You could never learn about an individual person. So th it was useful because there were groups of people or types of behavior, but you never knew anybody in that group. And we never gave the information to anybody else. It was always kept securely in the business. And, and as a result, in 20 years, there, were, there was never a major problem about privacy. Do you privacy. think new entrants will have that same sense of responsibility, the sort of digital players that are coming Oh, I think they must. Right. Yeah, and I, I think some have made mistakes, uh, and that's caused a problem. But they're going to have to set the highest standards uh, for privacy. And, and they're going to be required to anyway by, by governments. What, what do you make of... Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods. I mean, is this their first big step into competing with the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury's and others? And, and could they be the category killer? Well, it's a big change. It's a big step for them. If they were a pure online business to go and buy traditional stores, bricks and mortar, uh, as the Americans call it, uh, is a big move. Now, they've been in food quite a long time. Um, mm. The business is only 20 years old and they started in food 10 years ago and they haven't made quite the same impact in food as they have in other categories. But I suppose buying a Fortune 500 business is a bit of a statement of intent. Isn't it, it is, yeah. And so this is, this, is a, this is a step up and uh, largely it'll be focused in the US. Um, most of Whole Foods business is in the US and that's where Amazon will want to work on it and see if they can get it right. But a lot of change coming for the consumer experience, a lot of change coming presumably for the retailers, the space that they have, the jobs that they'll be able to secure in the future. Well, yeah, not, not, re not exclusively because of the uh, Whole Foods acquisition. I mean, that change was coming anyway because of the impact of the digital economy. Uh, you know, first on media, it's transformed media. Now on retailing, it's, it's changing retailing. And eventually on the whole economy for better or worse, and I, I think it will be for better. But in another way, the, the acquisition of uh, Whole Foods by Amazon signals that the way forward may be multi-channel retailing, you know, the right combination of traditional stores and online. Do you, do you think we'll still see the same volume of superstores that we see in out-of-town shopping centres? I mean, are those going to become the museums of the past or is there a future for this? No, I, I don't think that will happen. Um, I think it's more of a challenge in the United States because there's much more developed buildings and shops in the United States per head of population than there is in the UK. But, but presumably we're going to see businesses like Tesco experimenting with drones, with technology, ways that we have less jobs, those sorts of things. I mean, are we going to see a total transformation of the supermarket experience, do you think? Yes, I think uh, you must expect that. Um, more people are shopping online, um, that they, they might search online and then go into stores to complete their purchase. Um, they may 
order online and, and pick the goods up in store. Uh, they may see something extra online while they're in store and have it delivered to home. So you're going to see all of these things going on. And then retailers will innovate in order to do that in the most efficient way because they're good at supply chains. And do you get a sense that retailers themselves are excited about these changes, but how they might be innovating? I think they're a little daunted. Uh, the, you know, all industries are uh, overwhelmed by the pace of change that the digital economy brings. But I think they're beginning to uh, get on top of it. Uh, and you, you know, after the first disruption, you're beginning to see traditional retailers learn some of the skills and some of the potential of the digital economy and bring it into their business. And I think that's a very good thing for consumers because they're going to get a better experience from retailers. Right, so the experience is coming. Good place to take a break, I'd say. We're going to talk about your thoughts on leadership. We're going to talk a little bit about business and really the future of Britain and Brexit when we come back. Right. Now, stay tuned because we'll be back in a few minutes. See you then. <music> Welcome back. My guest today is Sir Terry Leahy. Now, Sir Terry, before the break, we talked a little bit about the match fitness of the, super, uh, the supermarket businesses. I'd like to talk about the match fitness of the UK and your lessons of leadership. Now, another tough night is uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. And I, um, I noted that he said, I've never played for a draw in my life. Something like that could have come out of your book. Are you the Alex Ferguson of business? Well, you have to be competitive. You have to want to win. Obviously, win fairly. Uh, make sure that everybody, you know, participates in the victory, whether it's shareholders or staff or customers, but you, you've got to play to win. And in a way, that's the message for the UK, uh, not to become overwhelmed by the political mm. negotiations around Brexit, but look beyond that and work out what we need to do to make Britain the most competitive place to do business in the world. So, but when we talk about the play fairly, I mean, we spoke a little bit about Amazon sort of getting involved in in uh, the UK supermarket business, possibly through Whole Foods. When you look at those businesses in terms of their obligation on things, like the amount of tax they pay, are they playing fairly by your own view? I think it's got to be looked at. You know, they, 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 in some way, they've had a, you know, a bit of a free pass at the internet businesses. Uh, you can understand why. Everybody's wanted to support the innovation, and they have transform people's lives in terms of a better consumer experience. But in terms of privacy, uh, some areas of regulation, some areas of tax, it needs to be looked at more thoughtfully to get a level playing field. So for example, um, business rates are based around property values and they don't really reflect the way a modern economy works. They don't properly spread the tax burden across the whole economy, including the new digital businesses. And I think that that would be a, a fairer thing. You wrote your book, Management in 10 Words. It's a great read. Um, if you were to think about one of those words, one of those 10, the word that you would like to be able to sort of advise your younger self on, take the most notice of it, what's the, what's the word you would actually take note of most? When you were there. Uh, can I choose two? You can choose uh, two. The beginning and the end. Uh, the, the, the first one was truth. And uh, that's important because when you're put in a position of leadership, you've got to show to your team that you understand what's going on. You know what position you're in, whether you're a manager of a football team or a business or, or a small group within a firm. Uh, and it, you know, because they, if they get a sense that you know where you're going, they're going to follow you. So getting to the truth of a situation is essential. You know, it may be worrying at first, but the battle is half won if you know where you are. So we've got truth. And what's the second one? Trust. Trust. Yeah, that's the yeah. way to lead. It's, it's not about what people do for you. It's what you do for them. It's what you inspire them to do. And you've got to put trust in people. And if you show that you will trust them and empower them, they'll follow you. There's the old political maxim that all political careers end in failure. Is, is, there, a, is there a trick to leadership in terms of knowing when to go? And did you choose the right moment, do you think, indeed? I think there is, go? yeah. Uh, I, I got to choose the moment, that's good. Uh, and uh, you, you've got to feel, um, have you done all you think you can do? And uh, is it time to let somebody else make a contribution? And that's a, it's a hard judgment to make. And it changes in 
every situation, uh, but that's what you've got to try and do. Well, well let's change the situation. I mean, how, how do you rate our political leaders at the moment from your uh, views on leadership? They've got a lot of work on their plates. I mean, politicians work incredibly hard on behalf of the electorate. They really do. Um, you know, I've been close enough to know that I could never be a politician. Um, but, you know, Scuttled Brexit one really... Of my next questions. <laughs> Brexit has really overwhelmed our political class. <clears throat> and I think there's a so danger... So would, would it have overwhelmed the cabinet made up of the Terry Leahy's and others? Even I mean, Is it a question of no matter how good the team, this is just an overwhelming situation? I suspect so, yeah. And uh, the, 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 the trick now is to support our politicians so we, we get them above this one issue, important as it is, and look beyond it to what makes an economy successful, because it's more than Brexit. I mean, you're, you're the sort of person that people pick up the phone or phone to to get a view in terms of how things are going. When you look at underneath the froth of debate about Brexit, do you get a sense that these negotiations are going well for Britain? I think it's, it's difficult. Uh, it, it, I always felt it would be difficult, and, and that's how it's turning out. Uh, clearly, we, we're going to have to get through it. Um, I, I'm one of the people who feel a transition period would be better, j just because it you will take longer. You were a longer. Remainer, right? I, I yeah. was a Remainer. Right. Has anything changed? Do you feel anything to be optimistic about in terms of business opportunities in a post-Brexit world? Well, look, the, th the, the things I worried about have happened. Uh, nevertheless, look, the decision has been made, uh, and now we've got to make the best of that decision. Uh, which means for me a period to get the arrangements in place and then as soon as possible set out an ambitious vision for Britain in the future uh, where we educate people well, we work hard, we're enterprising and we go and compete with the rest of the world. But do you think we're going to get a hit to the economy? I mean are we going to be a, a less successful nation? I mean Mark Carney said recently that the conditions as he saw them, should mean that Britain should, in theory, be booming rather than just growing. Well, there is something in that. Uh, you know, you don't see the counterfactual of what would have happened, but the economy has slowed down. Uh, but it's still growing. Uh, consumer confidence has been hit, but it's recoverable. So it, 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 it's, it's on a knife edge. Uh, as soon as we can lay out an ambitious plan that people can invest behind the better, because I think that can recover the situation. Right. But if we don't, it could get serious, because investment decisions at the moment are, are being held back because of a lack of confidence. Right, so give, give us a sense of how serious that is, I mean, in terms of what people should be thinking well, about. Well, it's, it's potentially very serious. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. You know, there's been a slowdown, not a collapse. Um, but it's very serious. People in America, in Asia, in the rest of Europe, they, they, they will invest in the UK if they feel they know what the UK is going to be like in five years' time or ten years' time, because they're investing for the long term. And if they're uncertain about that, they won't invest. They'll go elsewhere. So, so you wrote um, earlier in the year that there was no political party for business. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I'm worried about it. Uh, if you go back a few years, back to the days of New Labour, Conservative, they were falling over themselves to be the party of business, at least in the rhetoric. Look at it at the last election, and they were almost falling over themselves to be the voice criticising business, and, and I, I think that's uh, a real concern. I think they've, they've been deflected by Brexit. I think somehow they've got in, uh, in their minds that an angry voter uh, uh, wants to uh, see more state and less business. Do, do, uh, and I think that's a misconception. Do you, think, do you think that is just the job of the politicians, or do you think business could be making a better job of stating uh, Business case? needs to make a better job now. We, 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 we've, uh, so hence we've got we need to be you in, in yeah, government. We've got yeah, to, as... you know, look, the, 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 the foundations of every successful society, every first society, is enterprise uh, and a strong wealth creating economy. They're the foundations. Everything else we want to do, you know, in the hospitals, the schools, you know, in terms of the quality of life, comes from that. And of course, I mean, you're backing entrepreneurs now. I mean, you're not sort of associating yourself that much with corporations. I mean, do you see entrepreneurs very much as the future of the UK economy? I, I do. 
yeah, and uh, it, there's some great stories. Uh, and actually, the digital economy, which is so vital, does very well in the UK, and we have one of the largest, if not the largest, part of our economy in the digital sector in the world. We've got some world-class universities as well. Uh, E-commerce is huge here, which I think gives people confidence around the digital economy. So there are some good signs and some great business startups. And it's much easier today to start a business in the digital world than ever before. But the whole of this conversation has been about change and about how you cope with change. In terms of your advice to leaders, in terms of how they make sense of this changing world, what it means to lead through change. What's the advice you'd give them? You've got to work out in your own mind um, what this change means for you and your business. Uh, and you've got, to, you've got to at least look as if you know what you're going to do about it and where the business should go. Because you've got to give confidence to the rest of your team. Because if, you know, if they're confident, if they've got someone to follow, uh, you know, they can do a lot and they can get through the change in a very positive frame of mind. So <clears throat> if change is coming, it sounds like winter's coming from Game of Thrones, if change is coming, looking forward to 2018, I mean, are we going to look back and think 2017 was quite a quiet year in comparison, or do you feel we're going to get to grips with all the things that are changing and happening right now? How, how do you think 2018 is going to pan out? Well, I'm an optimist. All, all business people tend to be optimists. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, 2018 will see, signal the start of an upturn uh, in the UK. But for that to happen, uh, we need more clarity around those Brexit negotiations and we need an ambitious plan laid out for the future of Britain beyond those negotiations. Feels like an optimistic note to leave it on. Thank you very much to Terry Leahy. And there you have it, a veritable Christmas carol of change, challenge, and creating the next chapter for British business. Thanks to my guest, to Terry Leahy, Britain's own Santa for shoppers, my last guest in 2017. And we'll be back again soon with more business tales of our time, right here on The Capital Conversation. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.